Welcome to the eighth presentation of the Claire M. Hubbard Sustainability Series and our first virtual presentation. My name is Sally Hopley and I am the Coordinator of Sustainable Practices at MCC. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event and to introduce our speakers for tonight. The goal of the Hubbard Sustainability Series is to showcase sustainability experts to the entire community. To achieve this goal, MCC has developed a series of presentations, each featuring sustainability superheroes and providing them at no charge to the public. Today's topic is on pollinator species, why they are important, and what you can do to help. I'd like to give a special thanks to the trustees of the Claire M. Hubbard Foundation for providing the resources necessary to support this important endeavor at no cost to the public. Your generosity is very appreciated. Also, thank you to our MCC IT staff for their work and our speakers' flexibility and patience as we work to make this event happen. It's wonderful to find new solutions and new ways of working. Today's talk comes at the beginning of National Pollinator Week, which celebrates the importance of pollinator species. Due to, due to a decline in habitat and food sources, many pollinator species are in decline. These species are responsible for helping plants reproduce and are critical for food production. Pollinators are also important for supporting plants that help reduce so soil erosion. Between 75% and 95% of flowering plants on Earth need help with pollination. Pollinators are more than bees. They include bee birds, bats, moths, wasps, and small mammals. We will learn more today about these issues, these species, and what you can do to help. Before we get started, a few notes on the format for our presentation. As usual, the speakers will not take questions during their individual presentations. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A conversation chat in Zoom either during the presentations or after. After the presentations, we will begin the Q&A for all of our speakers. Also, if you are having technical issues on, during the presentations, please use the Q&A chat as well. Thank you all for attending our first ever virtual Hubbard event. And without any further ado, please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Jody Green is an extension educator with the Nebraska Extension in Douglas Sarpy counties. She has a master's of science and a PhD in entomology department at, from Purdue University. Jody works in the community, delivering insect-related information through presentations, extension blogs, newsletters, and radio and social media outlets like Twitter, Facebook, local news media, and NET's Backyard Farmers. She is also a co-host for the podcast called Arthropod. Although the main goal of her extension programming involves helping people prevent and manage pests in and around the home, promoting and conserving pollinator habitats for solitary native bees is a very important part of her programming. Jody started her family's pollinator garden three years ago and recently earned pollinator habitat certification. Uh, Jody, thank you for being here today. Thanks. Thanks. So I was invited here today to talk about the importance of native pollinators. And I think Sally did a really great job of introducing that so I'm gonna really talk about some of the insects that we see that are amazing pollinators that we're actually seeing right now. There couldn't be a better week for National Pollinator Week because if you go outside, you will see some of the most amazing things. But if you need to know a little bit more, did you know that every one in three bites of food that we eat are brought to us by a gift of a pollinating organism? Sally said some of the different organisms, they're not all insects but more than 75% of flowering plants rely on the pollination services, 35% of crops, and we get over $200 billion. This is worldwide, globally. And if you can see this list, this extensive list of some of the foods that we eat, I know coffee is a, like a necessity of my life, without pollinating organisms, we would not have these things. So because I'm an entomologist, my life revolves around insects, this is gonna be a talk that really focuses on native bees, but I have to give some shout outs to some other pollinating insects. And so some of these things that you may see today when I was out, you can hardly tell the difference between what's a bee and what's a fly because flies are the second best pollinator. And so when you look at these, you can see the diversity of these flies. If you wanna know what the difference is between a fly and a bee, you really, if you can get close enough, you can count the wings. Flies will only have one pair of wings, and bees have two pairs of wings. Flies are actually the only insect order that have two wings. But flies also, their eyes take up their whole heads. They have small, short antennae. But you can see in these pictures up here that 
there are mimics. So one looks like a hornet, that top middle one, and one looks like a bumblebee. So that apisemitism, or uh, what's it called, uh, warning uh, colors, tells the predators not to eat them. And people may think they sting, but these are pollinators and these are flies. They're our friends. We also have pollinating beetles. And anytime I get a chance to find any organism that's covered in pollen, it's something that I want to take a picture of. These beetles that we are actually seeing right now are very similar to this soldier beetle right here. The ones we're seeing are yellow and black, but they need uh, the pollen for protein and they'll go and they'll chew. And what pollination is, is moving those pollen grains from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And that's why these organisms are so good at doing that. But we have many different, the ones that I have here are just some of our common ones that we see, but there are many pollinating beetles. There are also wasps that get confused for bees. And we, again, get a lot of questions about the difference between bees and wasps. Well, wasps and bees will be seen uh, feeding on nectar of plants. And wasps, they can transfer pollen, but they're really not as effective pollinators because they're not as hairy. So with bees, they're really hairy, and so they get to pick up all those grains. The difference between bees and wasps, though, are that wasps, well, they get a bad name. Most people hate wasps, but we're surrounded in wasps. We just don't know how cool they are. There are only a couple social ones that we maybe consider stinging insects. But these are also pollinators in our garden. They have stingers if they're females, and that's because the female wasp catches uh, other insects for their larvae. So that's a big difference between bees and wasps. Bees feed their larvae pollen, and wasps feed their larvae invertebrates, spiders, caterpillars. They do the free pest control and also can provide some pollination services. So we can't talk about bees without mentioning the honeybee. But these are non-native um, bees. They're domesticated from Europe. We often manage them like, like livestock. They're perennial colonies, so they're around all the time. With the help of beekeepers who take care of them, uh, you know, they provide a lot of services. So I don't want to say that they're not important because they really are, and they're great. Um, we've got a lot of beekeepers here in the Great Plains area, and I do want to give a shout out to the UNLB lab. So if there are beekeepers or people interested in becoming a beekeeper, please reach out to specialists who know more about this. But honeybees pollinate 14% of agricultural crops, and they bring in over $15 billion uh, value in the crop production in the US. So they are very important. But our talk today is really going to focus on some of the native bees that we have. And here is just, a, I guess, a collection of some of the bees in my garden. And you can just see that they are on different types of flowers. They all look a little bit different, but they are so useful and efficient. So bees, they are, they are hairy, and they collect pollen on different parts of their body. We always know about the bee's knees and you know, the pollen baskets, but all of these bees have a different way and place to collect, uh, to collect their pollen. Also, some of them are generalists and some specialized, so that means they go to really specific flowers. So they are very good with certain types of crops. Also with bees though, you just, the, what they feed their young is gonna be the same, but where they nest and where they may forage will be a little bit different. And so there are actually almost 4,000 species of bees in North America, and when you, <laughs> If you actually start digging into this, it will blow your mind because there are so many bees. And over 90% of those are considered solitary. So when we think of the social bees, we think of bumblebees and we think of honeybees, but look at all the other bees that don't have a hive or don't have a nest. So first we're gonna talk about another social bee. So these are the bumblebees, and we saw a lot of amazing bees earlier this season. But bumblebees are native and they're social bees. So there's a nest, a queen, and there are a lot of different bees that are workers. But there are over, there are 20 species of bumblebees in Nebraska. So a lot of times people think the big bees are the queen bees and the little bees are, are the workers, but there are so many different species. But if you can see this little video here, you can, this is a bumblebee nest. And so it's very different than honeybees, right? It's not an organized comb system. They're little, disorganized honeypots. And these nests 
can be in voids uh, underground in old rodent burrows. They could be in bee boxes and sheds and all different kinds of places. They just try to find a place in this early spring, uh, the overwintering fertilized female to, to build her colony and she starts doing that. So these are annual colonies. They abandon the nest each fall and start a new colony each year. So basically this life cycle is similar for all bees. They all go through complete metamorphosis. The a fertilized queen overwinters somewhere, could be in the chimney, could be who knows where it is, somewhere sheltered, so she survives. And in the spring, she finds a place, she starts creating some honey pots and um, providing food for her offspring. She has some workers and those workers end up doing all the work, getting foraging and feeding the brood, and she just becomes an egg laying queen. But um, that cycle goes through uh, the year, year after year. So. If you do see a bumblebee, they're amazing pollinators. And if there's somewhere you don't like, if you can wait it out to the first frost or winter, they won't be there next year and you can go back into your compost pile or shed. But um, you know, in some places you will be able to move them, but uh, only if it's, if it's safe to do so. But bumblebees forage on a wide range of flowers. They're strong flyers, and you can see some of the specialized flowers they, they can get in and out of. And um, here's me giving a high five to a bumblebee. These are just great, and there's so many different kinds. So now we're gonna go into solitary bees. And so these are bees that may nest close together, but there's no real queen or workers. There's just the one solo female that's building a nest and pro providing food for her offspring. But there may be large aggregations, so many nesting buys. Think of it as like living in a condo or in an apartment building. And these aggregations may persist for many years. So I have to talk about the carpenter bee. It's been here in Omaha. I've been getting a lot of calls about them. They do seem to damage people's structures, but they are amazing pollinators. And so really my wish would be that we could save all the carpenter bees and uh, you know, find a place that they can nest that is, is good for everyone. But they look like a, a massive bumblebee. The difference between bumblebees and carpenter bees is that carpenter bees have shiny bare butts. They don't have hairy abdomens like the bumblebees. And you can see them foraging, you can see them gathering pollen, and they just have that shiny abdomen. But the females, they have really strong mandibles, and that's to chew these perfectly round, like quarter inch diameter circles and create extensive galleries in uh, wood. So this kind of is our shed and our deck. Not, not so great for some of us, but I, I point, wanted to point out that this is a male carpenter bee, and the males are sometimes very territorial. So if you think you're being attacked or it's hovering in front of you, that's a male, and it's got a cute little face. But it does not have a stinger, so you can call it its bluff. These galleries are made in wood grain. They actually drill a little hole the size of her body and then she turns a right angle and she'll go with the grain. Um, she'll make little cells with bee bread, which is pollen and nectar. She'll lay an egg and all these little cells are separated by a wood pulp and that's where her little larvae will develop. Behind those little holes, this is what it may look like. So each one of those little compartments separated by wood pulp is a cell. So each one of those is where um, a carpenter bee larvae will turn into an adult. So now we'll go into mason bees. Um, we're almost at the time where they're probably done nesting. These are stout bodied uh, bees that are really pretty. They're vibrant green or dark blue, black. They're just beautiful. But they also provide some really great um, services for us and they nest in cavities. And a lot of times some bees, I mean, they're I wouldn't say they're lazy, they're busy all the time, but they would rather nest in cavities that are already there. So, um, you know, we, this is an opportunity for people to um, provide nests for them. In nature, they will nest in hollow stems, cracks in stones, any little tiny void that is good for them um, to, to make their cells. And unlike the, like, like the carpenter bee, but a little bit different, they use mud to separate their, their cells and um, use that for their nesting. And this is just a little video of an artificial nest, but you can see there's this um, shiny mason bee going in and nesting. So they actually emerge early spring and they're done nesting by about now. And then they overwinter as fully formed adults in these waterproof cocoons. Um, they are just so wonderful. 
Um, another bee, this is what we're seeing right now. If anyone's got lambs here in their garden, go out and check it out. So these are, this is a European car wool carter bee. And this female here, she's uh, scraping the trichomes or hairs off that hairy leaf. And she's using that is in her nests for her offspring. So she's gonna put pollen in those cells, but it's gonna be all cushy with that wool. Sometimes we'll see these little balls in scrapes on our leaves and we wonder what's happening. And that is what it actually is. She might've been disturbed while she was collecting um, that, that wool. But um, she also likes to nest in artificial um, existing nests. Right now I'm getting calls that there is a mean bee in the neighborhood. And this is the male wool carter bee. It likes to chase um, other bees, butterflies, even people away. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mean bee, but that's, that's part of its life. And, and next I wanna talk about the leaf cutter bee. The leaf cutter bee has the cutest face. I know, it's just so cute, I'm not kidding. It is a great pollinator. It's the same family as the previous two bees that will nest artificially, but you will see these and they kind of look like little teddy bears. If you have nests for them, you will see their faces come out like this and it's the furriest little thing. These bees that I just talked about, they don't have like pollen baskets on their legs, but they have pollen on like on the little hairs of their, their stomach or underside and they'll scrape those off. For their, um, for their cells. But leaf cutter bees, they're very important when it comes to crops like alfalfa. These are also managed. So, you, so there are people that farm these or um, nest, like keep these as nests and then release them um, you know, through the season. But these are active through the summer and their development is really based on temperature like all other insects, right? Because they're, they're cold blooded. But leaf cutter bees, they'll nest in a variety of cavities and this is, why, this is what makes them so fun. Um, and you can see that picture there. You can see all the pollen under the underside of like their, their tummy or belly, but you can see the, the female bee goes in and sometimes she's carrying leaves or petals because she will use plant material as her nesting material. And then she goes back in uh, abdomen first and scrapes that pollen off. And some people will see this in, on their broad leafed plants. They'll see these semicircles or circles cut out of their leaves and they'll wonder what's going on. That is a leaf cutter bee using the materials that we have. Do not spray those leaves. And if you wanna know what those cells look like, sometimes we accidentally dig them up and sometimes we harvest them. And this is what those little cells will look like. You can see that they are leafy. They're not waterproof like the mason bees, but they'll have you know, petals or leaves on them. I do wanna say that when we just talked about all those um, cavity nesting bees, that's only 30% of those 3,600 bees. 70% of solitary bees actually nest in the ground. And so we wanna be cognizant of that and we wanna make sure that we conserve places that will be good habitat for, for um, ground nesting bees. So this is the part where you can help. How can I conserve native pollinators like bees? So I came up with this list, so learn about the bees. This is just a short introduction, but there are so many places and resources for you to learn about bees. Also, you wanna feed the bees and you wanna water them too. We wanna to reduce pesticides in our yards and in our landscape. We wanna provide that habitat and I can show you how, and there are a lot of resources to do that too, and provide nesting material, right? Have those plants out there that will help. We also don't wanna forget about those ground nesting bees. So get educated and learn about the bees in your backyard. There is this great book here that I would love to recommend, The Bees in Your Backyard. And if you are interested in any of these links or resources, I did put together a list and I'm sure we could get that to uh, viewers of this presentation. Um, there are also the Xerces so Society, which is very interested in the conservation of um, pollinators, Bumblebee Watch, and the Pollinator Partnership. There is no shortage of uh, getting to know bees. You also wanna feed those bees. And so there's resources to help you plant plants that are native to your habitat that will help um, help feed the bees and ha feed the bees not just in the spring or in the summer and the fall, but all times. You want blooming plants all season long. You also wanna reduce pesticides in your yard. And this is something that is really hard for people when they want to control everything. But we wanna use cultural methods like picking, hand picking off those beetles or just spraying with water those aphids. We want to make sure that when we do something to the ecosystem that we're not disrupting so many different relationships there. Remember that natural or organic doesn't mean that it's safe for everyone. It doesn't mean that it's safe for bees. 
And we want to provide healthy habitats for na and nesting materials. So that means we can put out rods, we can put out natural pithy stems and things like that where they can nest. And we also want to plant plants and leaves that they can use for their nesting material. There are resources that can show you how to make your own solitary bee hotel with all the measurements and the depths. And so, um, you know, look into something like that. They are, you know, not maintenance free though. We want to make sure we don't bring in pathogens to the bees in our backyard. So, I mean, you can use all sorts of building material to make your own solitary bee habitat. Here are just some examples. But when you do have a lot of things in a high density, you know, it does open up to disease, pathogens, and parasites. So if you want to do some more reading on how you can provide clean nests each year for them. And then lastly, I mentioned those ground nesting bees. They need to be loved and protected too. So sometimes we don't want to mulch everything. We want to leave a bare patch of soil. Some loose soils are best. We want to eliminate some of the tilling or digging up the yard when we don't need to or the garden. Um, we want to make sure all of those bees come out after they overwinter. And a lot of those ground nesting bees come out early and start pollinating our fruit trees. So um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. I hope this has sparked a little bit of interest in conserving your solitary bees. Okay, thank you, Jody. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, the Extension Office is very lucky to have you. Uh, we did receive a couple comments. It was difficult to hear me earlier, so um, I think that we have got that fixed, so thank you very much. Um, if you didn't hear me earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the Zoom Q&A. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be doing questions at the end of the next presentation. Um, so with that, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our next speakers. Um, Nancy Scott and Nancy Cruz are on a mission to help pollinators. Combined, they have over 80 years of horticulture and gardening experience and are both master gardeners. They are passionate about protecting pollinators with an emphasis on the monarch butterfly. Nancy Scott is a talented artist, avid nature photographer, and lifelong environmentalist. She illustrated the book Woody Plants for Central and Northern Prairies by Richard Sutton and Walter Bagley and is a board member of Prairie Pines Preserve in Green Bellevue. Nancy Cruz is a retired naval officer, avid, avid gardener, nature lover, and lifelong environmentalist. She's the Western Iowa coordinator for the nonprofit Milkweed Matters, whose mission is to restore pollinator habitat along roadsides by tossing seed balls during large scale bicycle rides, such as Ragbri. The Nancys are a dynamic team, and over the last four years have been involved in education, outreach, and habitat restoration for pollinators with an emphasis on the monarch butterfly. They have traveled to Mexico to see the monarch butterflies in their winter habitat and established an international exchange program with students in Mexico and the United States focused on monarch conservation. They co-authored a bilingual children's book in 2019 entitled Saving the Monarchs. It tells the story of the threatened monarch butterfly, why they are endangered, and what we can do to help them. Since 2016, the Nancys have made over 50,000 milkweed and native nectar flower seed balls with local schools, church groups, scouts, garden clubs, senior homes, and other groups. And with that, I will pass it off to the Nancys. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Sally. Um, I'm Nancy Cruz, and this is Nancy Scott, and we're wearing our team jerseys today for Milkweed Matters. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, during Pollinator Week to speak about pollinators, one of our passions. Uh, we have so much fun uh, helping the pollinators and the monarchs in particular. Uh, we've had a lot of adventures and I'm very grateful. If we were standing next to each other, I'd have my arm around her, but we can't do that today. So um, at any rate, it's an honor to be here. So our presentation is entitled Saving the Monarchs. So pollinators are decreasing worldwide. A United Nations assessment in 2016 indicated that 40% of invertebrate pollinator species, and this is the insects, the bees and the butterflies, um, face extinction. And then the report also indicated that 16% of vertebrate pollinators are also under threat. And these are the birds and the little lizards and 
other small creatures that assist with pollination. So why do we care about pollinators? Well, pollinators are very important for our food. Pollinated agricultural products account for 30% of our food. And annually, uh, from an economic perspective, in the United States, it's 20 billion in agricultural production. And then globally, it's over 217 billion. So it's huge economically. Pollinators are responsible for pollinating more than 80% of plants on, on the planet. And without pollinators, many plants could not set seed or reproduce. And because of the food chain, animal populations that rely on these plants would die out and there would be serious economic implications for humans and ecosystem diversity and stability in nature. So they're really important. Monarchs are one of the pollinators that is in trouble as well as all the others. And they used to be quite plentiful. And about 20 to 25 years ago, the population has begun to drop at least 90%, people say. And as a matter of fact, the Fish and Wildlife Service is considering to uh, put it on the endangered species list. A year ago in 2019, the population had rebounded and we thought, oh, there's, there's going to be hope. But then last winter, the butterfly count of the monarchs was back down again. Monarchs are considered a flagship species. And what that means is that the monarch is more attractive to people than bees and wasps and some of the other little bugs. So what scientists say that if we can help the monarchs, then all those other species can also be helped. Let me tell you a little bit about the life cycle. The only plant that monarchs, caterpillars can eat and that they, the butterfly lays her eggs on is the milkweed. And that's the only thing they'll eat. For the first, oh, four to six days, the egg is on, um, just still an egg. And then up to two weeks long is how long the caterpillar leaves, lives. The last phase of the, the metamorphosis of the, or before it becomes a butterfly, when it's a caterpillar, is it becomes a chrysalis. It's a beautiful emerald green with gold uh, chrysalis. And about a day before it begins to eclose, which is the word uh, for when it turns into a butterfly, it goes clear. And you can actually see the butterfly through that chrysalis. And then it becomes a butterfly and all it needs then are nectar sources. So the two things that the butterfly, the monarch butterfly needs is milkweed for the caterpillars and nectar for the butterfly. The monarch butterfly goes through an amazing migration. All of the butterflies, monarch butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains migrate to Mexico in the fall and then they migrate back to Canada in the spring. They need that milkweed and nectar habitat, nectar flower habitat, all along the migration route in order to sustain their population. It takes about four or five generation to, generations to make the migration north. And then the last butterfly of the season is different than the butterflies all through the summer. That last butterfly is called the super generation, and it lives for eight months. It goes into a state called diapause, where it does not breed and it just prepares for the migration. And it nectars and gathers energy and it migrates thousands of miles all the way to Mexico. And that butterfly, the super generation, lives eight months and that's the one that will emerge from the forest in Mexico in the spring. So their annual cycle, uh, in March, the monarchs uh, begin to wake up. They've been in the forests in Mexico all winter. And they begin to, when the conditions are right, they begin to head north. And it's that same butterfly, that super butterfly, that migrated down there. And uh, they're t worn and 
sometimes very tattered, and they begin to fly north, and they might make it as far as northern Mexico or southern Texas, and they're looking for their host plant. Uh, they're looking for milkweed. And they will lay their eggs, and then they'll die, and then the next generation will continue that migration north. Now, some of the butterflies in the first and second generation will head all the way to Canada, and then some will stay in the Midwest. Uh, we begin to see them in our area as the milkweed begins to sprout here, so around mid-May. And then by the third generation, June, July, they become more plentiful. And, and actually, we'll, we start seeing them now. I've been seeing them in my garden the last few days. And we saw caterpillars before we saw the butterflies. But, um, we knew they had been there because we found the caterpillars. And then uh, towards mid-August, that fourth generation, that's the super butterfly. Mid-August to early October, and they're the ones that live eight months and will make that journey south. When they're in the United States and southern Canada, it's amazing that there are over a hundred species of milkweed. There's not just one kind of milkweed along their route going north. There's a lot of different species of milkweed. And so it's really important to have that milkweed for the caterpillars. And then the nectar sources. And you want to have nectar sources from early in the, in the summer all the way through that fall migration. In Mexico, they don't really need the nectar. A few butterflies will nectar, but mostly what they really need is what's called oyamel fir trees. And there's forests that are up in the mountains, and it's in an area about 75 miles in diameter that's west of Mexico City, and only up in the mountains. And they have to have the oyamel fir trees, and they have to have moist meadows, or maybe uh, places where there's water that has muddy, uh, areas where they can sip the water out of the soil. It's, it's really interesting. They can't, can't use like bird baths. They need to have mud that they can use their proboscis, which is the little thing that they suck with, and they'll, moist, they'll suck that moisture right out of the soil. So the reasons for the monarch decline primarily are loss of habitat. And this is due to expanding urbanization, um, also, um, farming in the Midwest. There are over 22 million acres of farms in the Midwest that um, a couple hundred years ago was all prairie. And in modern farming practices, there's extensive use of pesticides and herbicides to um, control the pests and to keep unwanted plants out of the fields. So this has really uh, decimated the habitat. Um, as their habitat shrinks, the monarchs are more vulnerable to parasites and pathogens. And mowing practice is also having an impact on their habitat. Um, the native plants in the Midwest grow along the roadsides. And uh, mowing practices uh, that are not well informed can mow down these native plants, the milkweed and the nectar flowers that the, pollinate, that the monarchs and other pollinators rely on. And then in Mexico, there's illegal logging. Um, around these very unique forest preserves that the monarchs overwinter in, the villages are very poor. And the people, just about all of them, still cook with wood. So there is some illegal logging, even though these reserves are protected. And it's not like bulldozers. It's, you know, somebody would go in in the dead of night and cut down one tree, and then it's a source of income for them, too. So that's a real issue. And then also climate change is having an impact on the monarchs and their migration. Uh, as a warming world changes the territories of the plants and uh, the pollinators, uh, the change in time of flowering, and then drought is also having a big impact. Will the flowers be there when the, when the monarchs need them and when other pollinators need them? Increased severity of storms and erratic weather patterns are also having an impact. 
A few years ago in Mexico, they had a snow and ice storm in the mountains, and that's not normal for down there. It, it hardly ever freezes. And that particular incident did kill a lot of the butterflies. And as a reminder, all the butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains are down there in Mexico, so they're so vulnerable. So how can we help? Uh, the primary way we can help is to restore habitat. And we can do that in our own backyards by planting pollinator gardens. We can do that also in our communities and in, at schools and uh, libraries to create more habitat. We can advocate to protect these pollinators, these insects. Not all bugs are bad. And they need our help. They are under threat. We can support conservation education uh, by um, educating adults and children to uh, learn that these pollinators are important and that we must protect them. And then we can also participate in citizen science. There are lots of opportunities to help the scientists learn more about the monarchs. And um, it's so much fun, and it's great for children. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these areas in the slides that follow. Like Nancy said, conservation starts at home. You can start in your own backyard. And just think about your yard. So many people have nothing but grass and maybe a few bushes. And that really isn't all that great for the pollinators. Biodiversity in nature is what really keeps the insects and, and other pollinators um, alive. And you can do that in your own yard by reducing your yard and putting in plants like milkweed and, and nectar flowers that will attract the pollinators. And no, it's not even, uh, like say if you live in an apartment, it's not the impossible. You can have a big flower pot full of flowers that ha would attract the pollinators. So you can do it even in a small area. It's really important to think about planting native plants. They've evolved with the insects over thousands of years, and they're what the, the insects actually need that are in our area. The other thing about natives is that they're drought resistant. So when we have some of these hard summers, they're more likely to survive than some of your more tender plants that you maybe got at the nursery. And Another thing, if you've got the space, spread it throughout your yard. Don't just have one little area. Ha try to have some in your front yard and your backyard so that there's a place for all these uh, plants and many places for the, the insects to, to nectar. Some research was done on milkweed and where monarchs actually lay their eggs. And they found that if you've got an area, that um, a flower bed, and you've put milkweed in the middle and on the edges, that they're more likely to lay their eggs on the outside milkweed plants. So that was just another little hint. What you also want to do when you're planting your pollinator garden is plant for full season bloom. Some plants bloom in the spring, others in the summer, and then others in the fall. And by having a full season bloom, you support the monarchs and other pollinators all season. And many of these native plants are perennials, which means they will come back year after year. So they'll just keep getting better. And um, there's a lot of people that love to plant pollinator gardens, so there's always a lot of folks that can help you. Um, you want to by planting for full season bloom, it's going to increase the diversity of pollinators in your yard, and it's going to be beautiful. You know, you're going to have something new every few weeks. So fall blooming nectar sources are so important for that super butterfly, the last butterfly of the season that's going to make that, that long journey to Mexico. So you really want to plant these fall blooming nectar sources. Uh, the photo in the middle is um, aster, and that's a good fall blooming nectar source. The one on the bottom right, the yellow one, is goldenrod. And that's a wonderful fall blooming nectar source that is high in protein and helps fuel the migrating monarch. The one on the bottom left is a heliopsis, and this one also blooms in the fall. And in the, in the upper right, 
Uh, it's not native, but this is a sedum called Autumn Joy, and the butterflies love it. People often forget about providing moisture for, or water for the butterflies. And, and what's really interesting, it's not like bird baths where they have a big deep water to, to splash around in. Butterflies, like I mentioned earlier, will use their little proboscis to sip water like a straw out of that mud. And that's what they do in Mexico. In your own yard, it's really easy to make your own butterfly puddling source. You can take a, a like a flower pot that doesn't have a hole at the bottom of it, fill it full of soil and let the water fill up in there and you'll have that nice mud. And the other thing that's interesting is that butterflies are cold blooded and that means that in the morning when it's cooler, they are rather cold. And so if you have some nice stones, flat stones out in the sunshine, they can spread their wings out and, and uh, warm themselves up. You wanna limit your pesticides. Just remember that insecticides will kill all insects. You want to try to encourage having things like your praying mantises and lace wings and ladybugs. And try not to use pesticides if you can. And, but think about if you're spraying or people spray when it's windy, that is going to spray to other people's yards or other plants. And, and it's just not something that you want. And then try using that thing, methods that are less harmful, or at least to other, other insects. You can pick them off, or if you're have, we have worried about weeds in your garden, rather than spraying, you can put some mulch down. So we wanted to provide you with some resources, local resources, to help you get started with your pollinator garden. Um, the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum is a great source of native plants. They're located in Lincoln. They have a greenhouse there, and they grow a wonderful variety of native plants. They have plant sales a couple of times a month, and they have a big one in the spring. And then uh, pre-COVID, they brought plants over to the Extension Office in Omaha, and you could go there and buy them. Um, Midwest Natives Nursery is new, it's in Lincoln, and they had a wonderful selection of native pollinator plants this year, and I think they had a one, they sold out, they had a, yeah. they had a great year. Uh, Bluebird Nursery has been around for quite some time, they're also a great source. Stock Seed Farms is just west of uh, Omaha, and they're a great source for uh, native uh, prairie seed and pollinator mixes. And then Prairie Moon Nursery is another source. Uh, they're in um, southern Wisconsin, uh, but they have a wonderful variety of native plants in their catalog. Uh, you can buy seed or you can buy uh, plants. And their catalog is really educational. If you are, want to start plants from seed, uh, many of the native plants uh, require cold stratification to mimic what happens in nature when the seed gets cold and then thaws out again and it actually breaks the seed husk. So Prairie Moon Nursery's catalog explains exactly how to do it and it's, it's really helpful. There are so many resources online to help you get started with a pollinator garden and just to learn about pollinators. The extension offices are wonderful sources of information. And um, the one in uh, Nebraska, the Nebraska Extension, is a great source. And then Iowa State Extension is also a great source of information on pollinator gardens. The Xerces Society has just extensive information, and it's a big part of their mission to uh, promote pollinator conservation. Uh, the Monarch Joint Venture is also another source of information, and they've got a lot of uh, free downloads and just information about native plants. Uh, there's so much else out there, that, and I encourage you to go and look, and, and you can find more. One of my favorite things is working with kids, and encouraging your school to have a school garden is a really, really wonderful way that kids can get hands-on 
uh, practice seeing the plants, seeing insects, and just seeing how it is. It's just such a powerful way to educate kids. And it connects them with the natural world, and they can learn about those pollinators and learn about conservation. And what I really like is that the teachers can combine like English and science and all the different uh, subjects in with the garden and, and, and learning about pollinators and learning about gardening. Public and corporate projects are happening more and more as more people discover the problem about the pollinators being in trouble. Uh, one that's really, really neat is OPBD has changed over about 325 acres to native plants. And they've discovered that it, they are saving about $8,000 a year rather than having to mow it. And as a side effect, they discovered that they're having less erosion problems. Across the way, river over in Iowa, there's the Monarch Fueling Station, and they're doing something very, very similar with the Southwest Iowa Renewable Energy Ethanol Plant, and they're working in conjunction with the Monarch Conservation, the Iowa, excuse me, the Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium in uh, providing the plants and, and building a wonderful, wonderful natural area. Habitat outside in the, in, the, in the country, and if you've got an acreage or a farmland, CRP land, uh, the USDA helps with funding. Uh, if you want to try to convert some of the, your, your uh, land to uh, native pollinator areas, and uh, uh, the pollinator habitat, uh, importance of pollinators is, is a, a nice, a good source there. Look up, look up the CRP program in your area. You can also help by restoring roadside habitat. And this is an area that Nancy and I have been very active in the last four or five years. We've been working with a nonprofit called Milkweed Matters. And that's the team jersey that you see us wearing. Uh, the mission of Milkweed Matters is to restore habitat along the roadsides by tossing seed balls during large scale bicycle rides. Uh, we take our seed balls to Ragbri, uh, which is a week-long bicycle ride across the state of Iowa. Some of the projects that we've been involved in with Milkweed Matters involve community outreach uh, to educate about monarchs and other pollinators and to make seed balls. We make thousands of seed balls every year to take to Ragbri. And uh, so we work with uh, scouts and schools and church groups and garden clubs and really just about any group that will help us. Uh, the seed balls are made of clay and soil and uh, you mix water with that mixture and until it's the consistency that you can roll it into a little ball about the size of a marble. Then that little mud ball, we take our finger and make an indentation in it and insert the milkweed and nectar flower seed inside the ball and then pinch it closed and roll it up. Uh, we take these seed balls to Ragbri and uh, we've been doing that since 2015 and we're really proud that our team has made over 164,000 seed balls since 2015, and they've all been tossed along the roadsides by bike riders. Uh, Nancy and I uh, have also uh, been involved in a seed ball germination research study where we made um, over a thousand seed balls of varying different sizes, and we put different numbers of seeds inside the seed ball, and it was to determine how successful the germination was. We had a test plot in Mills County, Iowa. Uh, we partnered with Mills County Conservation, and then we monitored the germination uh, last spring over several months, and it works. We had a lot of seed balls that sprouted, and it was always, hooray, we got some. So it does work. Conservation education uh, is just absolutely imperative especially with the problem of the, the uh, pollinators disappearing. And I really think it's important to get kids involved in it as well as adults. Some of the things that you can do is you can collect the uh, wildflower seeds and the milkweed pods in the fall 
and then clean those seeds. Uh, you could have a seed ball workshop in, with a, your group and make milkweed seed balls. Planting milkweed and nectar flowers in gardens, whether it's your own or a public garden, is a really wonderful way. If you want to learn about how the butterflies is, uh, go through their life cycle, you can have them in a, like a little container and watch it, give it fresh, clean milkweed every single day. And you can watch that caterpillar grow and grow and grow as you feed it milkweed and then release it after it, it uh, he closes. One of the projects that we were involved with was that we involved kids from United States and Mexico in a letter writing program. So the kids really got to know these kids in another country who are also caring deeply about the monarchs. And because we had kids that we worked with here and um, doing monarch conservation and then the kids down in Mexico are doing things to protect, protect the monarchs there and they got to see, they, we, last year Nancy had the great idea to take a uh, camera and took pictures of each child and when they wrote their letter they included a picture of themselves so the kids in the other country got to see these are real kids just like me. Citizen science, this is, this is one that uh, Nancy and I have really enjoyed doing. Uh, I like to go on Journey North. Whenever I see my first milkweed coming up, I, I take a picture of it real quick, get on my phone, and, and you can t pinpoint right where you're standing, and it'll, it'll ping right where it is, and I send them a picture of, of the milkweed that I've got. Or if I see my first monarch, I try to get a photo of it, or the first chrysalis or first caterpillar, and then all along the, the, during the summer, whenever I see uh, monarchs, I can also do it then. Tagging is something that both of us have been involved with. My grandkids absolutely love doing it. You catch the monarch butterflies, and then they, you record the little number that's on that uh, tag from Monarch Watch, and it has a number on it, and you tell where you are and the date. And if that monarch that has the tag that you put on it down in Mexico, they find it, and then that gives the scientists a lot of information about the, uh, um, the migration route. Another one is mo the Monarch Larval Pro Monitoring Project with Monarch Joint Venture, and they're, re they're collecting a lot of long-term data. And there's so many other uh, uh, citizen science activities that you can get involved with, with pollinators and other animals, uh, the, uh, birds, all kinds of plants. There's just a lot of citizen science that you can do that they really need your help. So more ways we can help. In Mexico, um, the communities down there are planting trees. Um, reforestation. I mentioned previously that there was some illegal logging and um, for the most part, the communities that we have visited, they really understand how important it is to protect the forest. So they advocate for protecting the forest and the wildflowers that uh, surround the forest. In the United States, uh, we can visit and support these local communities in Mexico near the butterfly sanctuaries. They're very poor and our tourist dollars are so important for the community and it also helps them to realize how important it is to protect the butterflies. Um, you can also donate to conservation programs. Uh, our favorites, um, we just give a few here, uh, Milkweed Matters is one of them, the nonprofit that we're so active with to restore the roadsides. And then in Mexico, this, there's another nonprofit called Butterflies and Their People. And their mission is to protect the forest reserves where the butterflies overwinter. And they do this by providing jobs to local people. They hire guardians of the forests. The reserve that we visited is called Cerro Pelon, and the little village next to it is called Macheros. And Cerro Pelon is over 3,000 acres, this mountain reserve. And the Mexican government only uh, will fund two rangers to patrol that entire 3,000 acres. So butterflies and their people, um, it's really a family that for a couple of generations, they've been protecting the forest there. 
And Butterflies and Their People hires local guardians to patrol the forest and document the flora and fauna and then lead people to the colonies in the winter when you can go and visit them. And it's very high in the mountains, over 10,000 feet. And the only way you can get there is on horseback. And it's, it's quite an adventure and just so amazing to see. So all of our work with uh, the monarchs uh, inspired us to um, tell the story. Uh, we, we just felt so passionate about educating young people about the monarch and the incredible journey they take and how we can help uh, protect them. So we wrote a children's book uh, called Saving the Monarchs. And it's a bilingual because the children in Mexico speak only Spanish. And we uh, used photos in our book that documented our work. So there's, chil there's real children that we work with in Iowa and Nebraska and real children that we uh, visited in Mexico in the book. And the kids just love it when they see their pictures. Yeah. Uh, we donated uh, uh, about 40 copies of the book to the school in Macheros for the children there. And we're selling the book as well. And all the proceeds are donated to protecting the winter habitat of the monarchs in Mexico through butterflies and their people. And they use these funds to hire the guardians. And the photo there of the, those are three um, butterflies and their people guardians that patrol the forest. And during the off season, they, uh, they keep the trails open and um, document the flora and fauna. And it's so important because they're from different villages around the mountain and it provides an income for them. So if you'd like to purchase our book, if, when we were going to have this presentation in person, we were going to have the book there available. Uh, but if you'd like to purchase our book, uh, you can email me uh, at cruise.nancy at gmail.com. And I'll provide that so that it's available out there somewhere. And that concludes our presentation. We, we believe can, we can save the monarchs and other pollinators by restoring habitat and educating people and not using pesticides and participating in citizen science and donating to organizations that are helping. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you, Nancy and Nancy. This is Sally again. Um, I am going to remain off camera as we do the Q&A. So if you have questions, please remember to put those in the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, and in order to maintain social distancing, you may only see one of the presenters on camera at a time, but everyone has microphones. So we may um, just swap out a little bit on camera. So you'll see that. So um, with that, we do have a few questions. So let me go ahead um, and get those started. So um, I believe that this first one is, could be answered by any three of you. Um, <laughs> so um, there are a lot of signs, a lot of publicizing of the mosquito, mosquito squad or the mosquitoes hunters that spray yards every 21 days. Um, and do you have any thoughts on how to publicize the, the detrimental effects of these chemicals on insects and birds because they're starting to harm some of the local pollinator gardens? Well, it would be good if people didn't buy those services. It's really, we, I mean, I do get contacted by people who have gardens like all of us and that it is affecting them. So if people stop buying them, those services, then it would stop. And it's out of our hands, I guess. Are you aware of any educational events that focus just kind of on those repeated pesticide usage and, and how dangerous it is for local species? Are there, are there any educational events currently that you're aware of Research. or programming? Well, I mean, sometimes, I mean, the, the news or the media will, will call and they'll want to know about something. So it really has to do with people's interests and if enough people are interested in it, um, I think there are probably like homeowners association meetings and neighborhood meetings or county meetings that that gets brought up. I don't know if they ask 
a local expert or someone who studies mosquito. And I know there's the Nebraska Mosquito and Vector Control Association, who are like, that's a really good association that is, you know, got the people and the experts there. Also like health departments and um, they're always surveying for mosquitoes, especially when it comes to West Nile virus. So, I mean, there are scientists out there <laughs> doing it. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, um, is there a certain amount of space that's necessary to really make a difference if somebody wants to, you know, do some planting? Is there an area that's too small to be helpful? Yeah. I can, I can, yeah, where do I go? Okay. <laughs> we, so we all have mics, right? So. Okay. I think that you can have a small area, just as small as a, a small pot, flower pot or your deck if you don't have an area. It's really good if you can, have, if you do have a garden, but if you don't have that space, use what you do have. Get yourself a nice big flower pot and fill it full of, of flowers that the butterflies and the bees and the other little insects that like to um, pollinate can be growing, they can grow there and they have a place to have food. Yeah, I think, I think one way to really attract pollinators, regardless of the size of your garden space, is to plant the host plants uh, for the butterflies. Oh, and uh, so milkweed for the monarchs and the swallowtail loves anything in the parsley family. So parsley, dill, fennel, um, and there's others. You, you, I mean, mm -hmm. and in a small pot, you can grow those host plants and put the nectar flowers with them. And trust me, if you plant it, they will come. I think that's one thing people forget is that as caterpillars, they're all pesty. Like they're gonna eat your plants. But if you plant enough, it's gonna be okay. You, there's enough dill for you and enough dill for the swallowtails. So people always wanna see the butterflies, but they forget that those caterpillars need that food. So you can't have one without the other. So you've gotta plant the host plant and the nectaring plant. So it's... Um, are you aware of any good examples of pollinator gardens that support both the monarchs and native bees? If somebody wanted to go for like a really good yeah. example of what um, a pollinator garden would look like. Yeah, so there's at our extension office, like the Douglas Sarpy, we've got a lot of uh, plants there. I'm not, we do have milkweed there as well. I know I just had my garden certified and there's a lot of, I think there's over a hundred certified gardens in Nebraska, but the backyard farmer garden down in, um, in Lincoln on East campus, they're certified as like a monarch station and a certified pollinator garden. So, oh, and when I say uh, Nebraska certified pollinator garden, uh, it's, it was started by UNL's pollinator team and it requires like blooming plants in spring, summer, fall. It's got really great lists. So even if you don't want to get certified, just knowing what plants to get if you're out, because it, it can be very daunting when you go to a plant store if you want to buy them all, mm -hmm. right? And then um, the different blooms and colors and shapes are going to attract the different pollinators. So, you know, butterflies like different kinds of like long necked uh, Tube. I don't know how you even call it that. You know, the certain types of blooms and beetles will like certain ones. And so, you know, over time you get to see what is going to bloom in early and go away so you can put more plants together. But yeah, I mean, there is, there, you can reach out to us. We can probably direct you. And there are a lot of people who have certified gardens that like people coming by. So. <laughs> the, the the Bellevue Public Library has a little garden in the front of the Bellevue Library that has, it supports bees and butterflies and all sorts of little animals that are in it. Right now it's uh, covered in milkweed that is in blooming and if you'd like to smell milkweed in bloom, it smells kind of like lilacs. It's just very heady, wonderful smell. Thank you. Um, I may get this, this one term wrong. Um, but some folks are finding caterpillars on the milkweed um, and they're eating and it's great, but then they can't find the, the caterpillars in the next form, the crystal. The chrysalis, oh, the chrysalis. yeah. Um, where, where might they be hiding? So <laughs> what happens, uh, the monarch caterpillar, and I think probably all caterpillars, mm -hmm. uh, once they're ready to uh, form a chrysalis, they like privacy and they tend to go off and uh, go someplace where it's private. 
and so you might not find them. They'll crawl off the milkweed plant and mm -hmm. they might get up under a ledge or I've seen them in the weirdest places, like, you mm -hmm. know, along the edge of a house or I saw some on the bottom of a trailer. Yeah, I've seen them on doorknobs. Like they just, they just have to, they just leave the host plant. It's not safe for them to be there anymore. The plant's yeah. going to... Them. Because they're vulnerable, <laughs> and then when they when they eclose or hatch, they have their wings have to dry, and they're mm -hmm. vulnerable when they hatch too. So they generally, yeah, don't worry if they disappear; they're okay. <laughs> does eating local or and or organic um, does that help to support pollinator species? What was the question? I I think so. Um, Eating local and organic, it means that, well, especially organic means you're not going to use pesticides. So you are supporting a farmer that is using organic methods, and they're going to have pollinators uh, in their garden. And something that um, I forgot to mention, if you have a pollinator garden at your house, and you also grow vegetables, it's gonna help your production of your vegetables because the pollinators are gonna pollinate your veggies. And so it's, it's really wonderful to have, have both. Um, Jody, I think that this question is uh, most for you. Um, but when folks get their, their lawn aerated, does that help the bees that nest in the ground? Oh. Uh, not usually. I don't, they, they aren't going to be usually where there's turf. They like the loose soil. So, I mean, I've got a lot of mulched garden beds and I just have one that's bare, bare soil. And a lot of times they're just going to be in, in the dry parts. And it's, it looks like a little tiny hole. It's not a big, I guess, an aeration, aeration plug. So. Um, this one, Jody, I believe is also for you. Um, those leaf cutter bees that take the, just the circles out of the yep. leaf, can those, will those damage the plant? Will they kill it or are they just kind of taking little snacks? No, out of it? they're just taking little plant material for their nest. It's really small and it's just a couple leaves, so. I know that um, we specifically mentioned about the uh, amount of decline that the monarch butterflies are experiencing. Are we seeing any slowing of the decline in some of the pollinator species? You know, there's kind of been a rise in pollinator gardens and awareness an, on a bigger scale. Are we seeing any improvement in decline? I, they're, they're interconnected. And habitat for the monarchs is habitat for the pollinators too. And habitat for these insects are disappearing. And so I think they're all declining. And there have been studies recently um, in Europe and in other places that they've reported something like an insect apocalypse, that they are, you know, the insects are disappearing. And then that has an impact on those animals that eat insects, like the birds. And mm -hmm. In the news in the last year, the birds are disappearing too, and it's all interconnected. So, um, yeah, we need to be aware about the interconnections mm -hmm. in nature and re respect and protect nature. Thank you. Um, one other question. I think that this could be for, for anyone on the stage, but with climate change happening um, and as it's shifting some of the migrations or the, the habitats of some insects, are we seeing any, any new species or pollinators that might be kind of new native to Nebraska as things start to shift due to climate change? I don't know if there's more, uh, like, you, you know, there's usually a, a type of or certain species of butterflies that will migrate, like the painted lady also migrates, and some of them can, I guess, overwinter here. So, I mean, that may change that we see more overwintering where we are, that they aren't migrating as far. But as far as I know, I, I don't know at this time. All I know is that we see patterns um, of things emerging earlier or or later, or not going away as much, or over, you know. So, um, in terms of pollinators, it's going to be the same as, as pests, too. They're all going to, um, like, adapt to being around more, longer, you know. So. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So one of the things that I think you both spoke about was about pesticide use um, and how to try and reduce pesticide use as much as possible. Um, as far as there are some like natural or organic pesticides out there, are those do those tend to be less harmful for pollinator species? And specifically, um, someone is concerned about a natural spray for bagworms um, and now kind of being concerned about how do you know what's actually okay. safe for pollinators yeah. or not? So a lot of it, so when we talk about just the product itself, uh, you know, I, I would say that just because it's natural or organic doesn't mean it's safe. I would never say that anything is, is safe. And when it comes to treating, so the reason why we recommend, and this, I guess it's organic, but it's um, called Bacillus thuringiensis, um, it's BTK for the, for the caterpillars. So that protects like the bees and other things. But when it comes to monarchs, that's also a caterpillar. So we don't want to kill that. But when it comes to the treatment for bagworms, it's like the, usually an evergreen tree. We're not spraying blooms. We don't want to spray when these are foraging, actively foraging. So daytime, we don't want to spray some things um, after the blooms fall off. We don't want to spray what um, you ladies said about like drift. It's got to be like the right time. I mean, if there needs to be treatment, there are ways to do it to protect pollinators. So you just need to be cognizant of that. So you're right in that that will also harm caterpillars, but you want to treat a you know, where, where are there are no caterpillars that are gonna turn into butterflies that you wanna keep. But when it comes to uh, deciduous trees, they lose their leaves. And so bagworm shouldn't kill deciduous trees and they shouldn't be killing flowers either. A lot of times um, later in the season, bagworms are big enough that you can hand pick them off and put, throw them in soapy water. So that's always an option. So there are options. A lot of times though, people want a quick fix and they want to spray and so you know, we try to give them options to make the best decisions, so. Sorry, I'm just looking through, <laughs> through the list um, right here. Um, are there certain species of milkweed that are better for monarchs than others in this area? What do you guys think? There are, oh, I think about, five or six different species of milkweed that are native to our area. Uh, I have read that they prefer the common milkweed. However, they will lay their eggs on all of the milkweeds. And the common milkweed is, uh, has very broad leaves and it's, it's a great one to, uh, you know, to feed the caterpillars because there's a lot of surface area of the leaf. Okay, great. Um, but it's nice to have more than one yeah. variety in your garden because the, the common milkweed. milkweed gets about mm -hmm. about this tall, and uh, some of the other varieties, like the butterfly weed, only gets it's a bush, and uh, mm -hmm. so it's really nice. And it has an orange. Mm -hmm. The butterfly weed has an orange flower, and the common milkweed has pink flower. Yeah. And there's a yellow one, the mellow yellow, or there's a yellow one. And then the swamp milkweed's great too. I've got that one in my yard. Yeah, and then there's showy milkweed as well. <laughs> and, and then in our area, there's a world milkweed as well that has a little white flower. So um, it's nice to mix it up and have quite a few varieties in your garden. There's also quite a few other variety or other species of milkweed that do live here, but they're not quite as common and they're not often seen in the, in the trade. The ones that Nancy mentioned are the ones that you're more likely to find. If you're out hiking in the prairies and stuff, you might be able to find some of the other species, but they're not very common. But the, the butterflies will, the monarchs will lay their eggs on all of them, like she said. Great, thank you. Um, we will have this presentation available to watch online um, afterwards. If you go to www.mccneb.edu backslash Hubbard, um, we will have a video to this presentation. Um, um, on a similar topic of milkweed, um, it does, so it has the seeds in the fall. Um, if you don't want those in your kind of trying to take over the pollinator garden, is there somewhere to, where you can donate the milkweed seeds? Oh. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nancy and I collect milkweed seed every fall because we make all these seed bowls. 
and uh, people always uh, want seed. We'll take your seed if you want to get rid of it, and um, yeah, we'll take it, and we give it away as well. So if anybody wants some seed, contact us, and uh, we will give you some. Uh, this year, we, uh, we always have the second graders at the Mills County uh, Nature Center clean our seed for us, and it's just so much fun. We use a, uh, a plastic bin, and the pods have got all the fluff on it, and it flies everywhere, and it's a real pain to clean. <laughs> So we get the kids out there over the, over the plastic bin and they open up the pods and it's, the wind takes the fluff away and they, they go like this and the seed falls into the bin. So we have jars and jars of seed right now because we couldn't have any workshops mm -hmm. this year because of the virus. So if you want some seed, reach out. We'll send you some. Good, thank you. Um, Jody. this next one is for you. Um, is there kind of an average lifespan for native bees? Um, it's usually the season. So a lot of them will, like for the mason bee, it comes out early and by mid-June she does her thing. So for the solitary bees, there's no, like, I guess, parental care. Like she puts them there and provisions them and then she dies. And so they'll come out the next year. Um, it's different for each bees, but it, they don't last basically like till the next year. And a follow up to that as well. Um, do the native bees nest in the same place every year or, or close to the same? Place? Uh, not always, but a lot of times like a good location is a good location. So, I mean, for a couple of years, I had no, none of those leaf cutter bees. I had to plant and I had to have the bees come and find those nests. But now like every year I put them out or the blocks back out after this, you know, it's spring and they, the new ones emerge. And so they've got food to feed on, they will feed. And then those tunnels are right there. So that's why I have to take those and get some clean ones. Um, and do that maintenance so that they don't get diseased. But they won't nest in the exact same, they, they may nest in those exact same ones, but I'm gonna clean them out. So I don't let them, but they probably would. But not with bumblebees and carpenter bees might. Bumblebees not always. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit different. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that this is about the end of the question list, um, but we have one more for you. So. If someone was going to take away one action or one key message from your presentation today, um, could each of you just kind of say what you hope that would be or what you think is the most important for someone to either do after this presentation or to, to remember afterwards? I'll start. Um, I think the big takeaway uh, from me is that pollinators are important in to us because of our food and important in nature um, and we should protect them and we can do that by restoring habitat in our communities in our backyards plant pollinator gardens put the host plants out there for these beautiful butterflies and um, protect them don't use pesticides they're important so i think that's my my That's a lot. Away. You took all of ours. Yes. <laughs> that was my thing, too. Um, okay, so I'll choose a new one. I, I would just want people to, to learn about bugs because they're not all bad. And I totally agree with Nancy. She basically took my thoughts <laughs> is that it's so important to uh, care for the, your environment. And if we lose those pollinators, we're in trouble too. And that's something that's kind of like climate change was a few years ago, nobody believed it, but it's really, really serious. And our lives are in, in, in intimately involved because we're a part of nature. We're a part of the whole natural scheme of things. And if we don't do something to stop the destruction of habitat, then it's gonna hurt us. 
Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you again so much for being here. Um, I know I learned a lot and it looks like some other folks did as well. Um, we will be posting this at our MCC Hubbard website afterwards. Um, but thank you again. Um, that is the end of our questions and the end of our event for this evening. So thank you all for attending and thank you to our speakers for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you.